I'm going to give you a few, uh, just sort of a broad brush of many things going on at the Hurricane Center. It dawned on me, uh, years past, I would not shown you anything about the building itself or some of the things you might not be aware of that we do. And in this picture, uh, that is the front entrance of the Hurricane Center. Now, how many of you heard of the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale? The architect for this building was an engineer by the name of Herb Saffir. I'm very comfortable riding out a hurricane in that building. It's, a, it's, an, it's also a good practice to show other businesses what they can do when they're planning. If you plan your building to ride out your worst case scenario, you don't have to worry about continuity of your business while you're working through a storm if you have to be there. The two inset pictures are two of the main communication uh, 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 things that we do out of the Hurricane Center. Uh, I can directly link up uh, uh, through our fiber optics and satellite systems with any of the broadcast stations that want to uh, do an interview during the threat of a landfall. We man that up as soon as there's a hurricane watch for anywhere in the continental United States. Uh, the uh, picture on uh, your right is uh, what we do for internal coordination. Whereas your local forecast office will be talking to the, uh, uh, your local officials, emergency managers, and decision makers on a conference call, I'm doing essentially the same thing at the federal, uh, regional, and state level. So the folks from DHS, FEMA, Corps of Engineers, uh, your state offices of emergency management, we're all on the line periodically to get the big picture uh, for their response to help you out down at the local level. When you see our forecast products on the website, uh, these are the faces behind the names of the names that are put on there. I call these my top guns. These guys eat, live, breathe, and sleep hurricanes. It's their sole responsibility. They don't have to do other kinds of weather. So they become your, your specialist, your, your subject matter experts. Just like when you go to your general practitioner to get a a physical checkup, if there's something outside their realm of expertise, they send you to a specialist. That's the case in the Weather Service with the Hurricane Center. We're your specialists that focus totally on the problem of hurricanes. Uh, a lot has been said while I've been here today about how active this season's going to be. And if you recall, when I was here last year, we were forecasting a tremendously active season for 2010. How many of you think last year was a busy season? Good answer. Most of you said yes it was because yes it was. But the difference was if you look at the map of the United States, precious little activity affected the continental United States. It happened to be the third most active season that we've got on record. The, uh, the other interesting facts about it, in, in, from August 22nd on is when most of the hurricanes occurred. If we had had the kind of activity at the end of the season, or at the beginning of the season, like the end, this season would have compared to the 2005 uh, hyperactive hurricane season uh, that we all remember, and of course in our case from Rita. June, don't forget about June hurricanes. Audrey in 1957 was the strongest June hurricane we have on record. Uh, Alex that we had last year was the third strongest and the strongest since Alma back in the 1960s. I'll talk a little bit about Alex. Uh, Alex didn't make a direct hit for as far as its uh, hurricane force winds or the center of the storm. Uh, it was heading towards, generally towards the mouth of the Rio Grande, but as you can see by the rather serpentine path that it took, there was no sure bet exactly where that thing was going to make landfall, uh, either north of Brownsville or south of Brownsville or even further south than it actually did, uh, which made a bit of a forecast challenge. Uh, but in the end, the, the, the high wind and surge aspects of Alex were confined to a relatively unpopulated uh, section of the, uh, uh, of the northeast Mexican coast. That doesn't mean there was an impact. Remember Allison, that was a weak tropical storm over the ocean, but look at the impact it did once it made land. Same thing goes for Alex. This is a radar image of the, of the uh, storm out of the Brownsville radar. And if you can see the cursor, probably not. There's too much on there. These bands, as they first started coming on shore at, in the lower Rio Grande Valley when the center was offshore, produced tornadoes and flash floods. Very typical. People get focused on the center of the storm as, as well they should. It's, a, it's an important part. But there you were 
150 miles from the center, and you started getting all these tornadoes and heavy rain. A hurricane is not a point on the map. It's the whole function of it. The other important thing to see on this radar loop is all the yellows and greens and oranges going from northeast to southwest over Mexico. That land goes from sea level to an average elevation over 3,000 feet. When you shove moist air up that land, it rains torrentially. As bad as we get heavy rain here in tropical storms where it's flat, can you imagine a heavier rain than what you got in Allison by being forced up terrain like they had in Mexico? And of course, the end result of that is very heavy rainfall amounts. Uh, everything you see there in uh, purples and blues is 10 inches or greater, and there's some areas in there that probably had very close to four feet of rain over those mountains in a two-day period. All of those sides of the mountains form rivers that are tributaries to the Rio Grande, and the end result is these kind of floodings. This was in Monterey, Mexico, who had not seen flooding like this since uh, Hurricane Gilbert back in the 1980s. Uh, the same streams flooded, but the, the lessons learned that Mexico took from Gilbert, they didn't allow people. Back then, homeless people and squatters would live down in these arroyos and they lost a lot of lives due to the flash flooding in Gilbert. No one was allowed to live there again, and the loss of life was minimal in Monterey because there weren't people down in the Arroyos. Uh, in Laredo, the rise on the Rio Grande, uh, she gives us pictures like we've become all too used to seeing along the Mississippi and Ohio rivers this year with the big spring flood season. The difference being this occurred over a period of days rather than weeks and months like we see on the big rivers in the middle of the country. Uh, another storm that we learned something from last year was Earl. Now you see, I'm here in Texas, why are you talking to me about a storm that went up the East Coast? Well, Earl, Earl taught us a few things about really good forecasts and what it may imply down the road for decision makers that have a really difficult call when it comes to evacuation. The toughest call relative to weather that your elected officials have is telling you you have to go in the height of a storm. It doesn't come without consequences. We lose lives and evacuations from people that are stressed medically already in a stressful situation being moved from nursing homes and hospitals to get them out of harm's way. So you don't take that decision lightly. You don't want to make it uh, until you really don't have a choice. The decision has to be made. Our problem here uh, and in, the, in the upper Texas coast is we're so built out into the evacuation zones that these evacuations have to start two days in advance of the landfall of the storm when the weather's like today. My forecasts have gotten incredibly better than when I first started out 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but you still have about 50 miles per day in track error. That's 100 miles. I can't guarantee you where the center of that storm is going to go. OK, about the story on Earl and why this is an important story. When it was out over the open ocean, this represents one forecast cycle. And you've probably all seen on TV what the TV guys call the spaghetti charts. That's not really what they are, but hey, you understand what it is, uh, what it means verbally. These colored lines you see on the big picture represent our best forecast models of where the storm will go. And from the start point through 72 hours, the forecast was pristine. The storm went where it was forecast. After that, the storm went further west the forecast tracks went further right. I have no reason with that type of a forecast from my guidance to forecast the track the storm originally went on. Prior to forecast models, the farthest we forecast a track was 36 hours, and it was mostly extrapolating based on the current conditions. So at that point, we're talking at day five, a 260 mile error. Now, if, that's for, if that storm was uh, aimed at the Louisiana, central Louisiana coast on the center line of that forecast, guess where it really would have gone? 50 miles to the south of Galveston. Worst possible scenario. Now, do you think at five days, if the skinny black line is coming out of the Caribbean and going over central Louisiana, that anyone here will think they have to evacuate in three days? Not going to happen. So that's our concern, is making sure we do the best job we can and get better and better at that track forecast at these longer lead times that your higher population and your more complex evacuations have led us to have to do. On the other hand, once the storm Earl started moving north, it behaved on our forecast like gangbusters. 
On this graph, I show the white line is the track that Earl actually took, and the blue lines represent all of our official forecasts. Not a single one of them varied more than 30 miles left or right. Well, other than the outer banks of North Carolina, nobody evacuated. Even though from their, their plans and our skill forecast, a case could be made that the outer part of Cape Cod and, the, and Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard uh, were on a pretty hard threat for hurricane force winds. The officials who didn't evacuate uh, felt they absolutely did the right thing. So guess what? The next time we have a storm going up the East Coast, and I forecast that skinny black line just off the coast, and remind them that it could be plus or minus 100 miles at 48 hours, do you think they're going to make a, de a decision, even if I tell them I don't have anywhere near the confidence that I had with Earl? They're going to hold their cards. And that's the message I'm, I always have here is when your elected officials tell you it's time to go, don't hold your cards. They're making a decision based on, on incomplete and always uncertain data. And at 48 hours, the chance of you having the core of that storm is probably less than 20%. But the chance of really bad things happening to you and your family if you stay and you're in an evacuation zone, and it happens, is 100%. The forecast will get better. The, uh, but that doesn't mean the storm won't come. My goal is to save lives. If we save property along the way, fantastic, but the storms, the big storms that come inland are going to do damage whether they're forecast perfectly or not. Okay? Makes sense?